Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. Happy holidays. This is our last weekly wrap up of the year. So I wanted to uh, wish you all a very happy holiday season and a very safe new year. My daughter's made up this really cool Christmas tree here that I thought I would open the video up on. And this week we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about, including taking some time off next week. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, we're also going to be looking at a controversy surrounding that glitter bomb viral video. This was the NASA engineer that designed the package that would shoot glitter and fart spray on people if it was stolen. Well, there was a little bit more uh, to the story about how that video got put together. And we'll talk about why I think YouTubers uh, do need to hold themselves to higher standards. Uh, we'll talk about some low standards on Instagram where people are faking sponsorships in order to attract followers. Uh, we'll also look at the safe harbor rule in the DMCA and why YouTube can't pre-screen videos. That came out of a discussion we had two weeks ago about people re-uploading my content. We'll talk about missing out with lossy audio compression. We had a good uh, discussion on this a few weeks ago and then last week with my Plex video. And I'll also talk about what life was like at 14.4K with my 14.4 modem way back in 1993 and how long it took to get stuff uh, off the internet and off your local BBSs. Lots to talk about, so let's get to it. Now, we don't have any new members to introduce this week, but I do want to thank everyone who contributed over the course of the year. It's been greatly appreciated, and it helps uh, fund the people that are working for the channel now. We have uh, one part-time person and then uh, someone who was helping me out over the summer who's been doing some remote work as well, and all of that stuff really helps out quite a bit. So I want to thank everyone for their continued support of the channel. But we do have an advertiser this week, and we're going to be looking at a really cool app on the Mac and Windows called PDF Element, and I believe they have versions of this for iOS and Android too. And what this lets you do is edit PDF files like they are just any other document. You can see that demo there uh, running on their website. And I'm going to show you actually how it works on my Mac over here, and this will be the same experience in Windows. And this week they're having a 50% off sale, so you can get a very good deal on this if you move quick. So let me give you a good use case for this. Uh, on screen right now is a document from my school board from 10 years ago. And every once in a while, you'll have somebody come up to you and say, hey, remember that document we made 10 years ago? Well, I'd like to change this and add this to it, but the original document is nowhere to be found, and all you've got is a bunch of scanned pages like I have here. I can't select anything here as I'm looking at this PDF because these are all just images. Now, what's cool about PDF Element Pro is you can load up that PDF file, and when you do load it up, you'll see here that it is detecting it as a scanned PDF, and I can perform OCR on the document. So I'm going to do that real quick here. It's going to create a new document so it doesn't do anything to the original, uh, which is also good so you don't have a destructive change here made. And you can see it's going through this six-page document now and finding all the text and creating that new document. Uh, that new document will load up here when I click on Finish so I can edit the uh, one that I just brought in. Now it looks the same, but if I click on Edit here, uh, you can see, first of all, I can move things around now. So I've got this block of text here that I can grab and maybe move down a little bit lower. I can change it to 2019-2020 uh, maybe to uh, reflect the current budget cycle. So I can make that change there. I can scroll further down here. You can see it detected all the numbers. So I could even adjust some of the budget figures on this. Now, if you generated these PDFs from an Excel file, of course, it won't recalculate things. But if you do need to make a small change to essentially a locked-in PDF, uh, you can do that. And it also maintains the original uh, graphics that we had here, namely the uh, handwritten stuff too that I can uh, move around independently of the text on the document now. So you do get a lot of flexibility here. It costs a lot less than Adobe software does. And again, you'll get up to 50% off if you act soon on PDF Element. So let's take a look now at the week in review. And we've got two things up on the Extras channel, which are my unboxing of the OWL car cam. And we also took apart the Lenovo Y7000P gaming laptop that you'll be seeing a little bit later this week on the main channel. So that's some fun stuff to watch there. And then on the main channel, we reviewed three different things. So one was a paid sponsorship. Uh, we had the OWL dashboard camera, which went up yesterday morning, and a lot of you were checking that out. My big frustration with this one is that it's got a really neat concept, basically giving you a security camera for your car. 
So if somebody were to break into the car or even bump it or just talk loud next to it, uh, the camera fires up, it records stuff and pushes it up to the cloud so you can identify what was going on. It's got a camera that faces outside and another one that faces inside the vehicle cabin. Uh, the problem though is that it has a subscription service tied to it and if you don't continue the subscription after the first year, uh, you lose all the notifications and you can't even extract the full resolution video out of the camera. Very frustrating. Uh, the other problem I had with it is that it relies on AT&T and in my neighborhood, AT&T doesn't work. Verizon works fine, which is what I have on my phone here, but I can't uh, access the camera at all when it's in my driveway, at least to get some of those features out. So I had to drive in the middle of, the, uh, middle of town to sit there and download footage from the camera at full resolution. Not the best experience for me, uh, but I do think the camera has promise if they can change some of their revenue policies. I don't like these things where they charge you full price for something and then expect you to pay them every year to keep using the features you paid for initially. I don't like that trend and I hope that uh, maybe they see the light on this and come up with a different way to grow their company. Uh, the other thing we did is we took a look at the Tidal music service, which is now integrated with Plex. We'll talk a little bit more on uh, lossless audio uh, a little bit later in the video because that's one of Tidal's differentiators is that you can get a much higher quality streaming service. It will consume a lot more data, but the music sounds a lot better. And we'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, we also looked at the K600 TV keyboard with integrated trackpad from Lenovo, this thing. Uh, and I was really surprised by how many people watched that video. Typically, keyboards don't get a lot of viewership in the early days, but a lot of you appeared to be uh, interested in this one. So I'm really happy that uh, we all had a nice uh, discussion around this product, and we'll see where it goes from here. I liked it a lot. Um, the trackpad isn't the best. I think their older trackpads were better. Uh, but the documentation was really poor on it, and the compatibility with smart TVs, which they're really pumping up as the main feature of the product, isn't all that great. And it's not all Logitech's fault, actually. The TV makers and the app makers for those TVs just don't support keyboards the same way. Uh, so it was a bit limited as to what you could actually type in, uh, especially on big apps like YouTube and Amazon. So I think this is still better off as a computer keyboard or something for a compatible set-top box. But nonetheless, uh, nice that you can have three devices paired up with it simultaneously and switch quickly between them. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. And this is week 96 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And I wanted to uh, let you know I'm taking next week off, if that's okay. Uh, because we've got a lot of family stuff going on and my kids are off from school. So it's just uh, uh, one of those weeks where I just really won't have time to sit down and do things the way I like to do them. Uh, so what I did is I worked a little harder this week to get a week's worth of content ready for the week that I plan to take off. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. So this wrap up was shot early. It's now airing, of course, on Christmas Eve, December 24th. And I've got two others uh, in the hopper already with one potential addition as well. So I'll let you know about that. Now, the wrap-up might get a little mixed up in this because uh, next week, of course, is the 31st, which is still part of my time off, and I was not planning to do a wrap-up on New Year's Eve, uh, but what I might do on New Year's Day is maybe a live stream of setting up the Mr. Project. So if you want to see that, uh, let me know down in the comments below, or I can do just a wrap-up, and maybe I'll put a poll out. Uh, on my uh, community tab to get some more feedback from all of you. So let me know in the comments, but I'll also put that poll up on the community tab to get uh, more feedback as to whether or not we should just replace next week's wrap up with a live stream, given I can't do it on the Monday night. And then the following week, I'm off to CES. So there probably won't be a wrap up that following week either. Uh, but of course, we'll have a full week of me running around CES. You'll have three or four videos from that event. So uh, there will be plenty of things to watch just a little bit off our usual schedule. And then when I'm back from CES, we'll get back into the regular Monday night thing with the premiere and everything else. So bear with me, just one of those things. It's uh, that busy time of year and it gets busier the older my kids get, but I love every minute of it. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this Glitter Bomb video controversy. Now, if you haven't seen the original video, definitely check it out on the uh, link you can see on screen there. Uh, basically, what happened here is a former NASA engineer had a package stolen off of his front porch, and being that he is an engineer, he figured that he would create some way to get back at these people that did it to him. Uh, so he invented a uh, bait package, essentially, that has cameras inside of it, GPS tracking, of course, and the ability to uh, fling out an, an enormous amount of glitter 
uh, to the package thief once they open it up. And then a short time later, it continuously sprays a fart spray uh, on the perpetrator until they feel compelled to get rid of the package. And at which time he goes back and picks it up to uh, get all the footage off of it. And as you can imagine, this video went super viral. I think it's had 45 or 50 million views at the time I'm recording this. All the major TV networks here in the United States covered it uh, because this is a very big problem of packages getting stolen off of front porches. The more we buy online, the more stuff is getting delivered to us uh, without having to go to the store. But if it sits on the porch all day, it's out there for somebody to come and take. And typically the police don't do much with these cases, even if you have surveillance footage because it's happening so often, uh, it's hard for them to direct the resources to deal with this issue. So this was kind of a, uh, you know, a vigilante justice here for people that have ever had to deal with this problem, which is probably why it was so popular. Now, what struck me, though, about this video was how often the package was getting stolen. They had uh, five different instances where somebody took the package and got sprayed with farts and glitter. And these were not the same people. There were different people stealing the package off this guy's front porch, presumably. And I was thinking, what's going on in this guy's neighborhood that you've got this rampant package? package theft going on and the police are completely oblivious to it or don't want to deal with it, you would think if it was that bad, they would at least set up a sting every once in a while to tamp down the crime and make it so people were aware that perhaps the police are actually watching here. And as it turns out, the package was not just stolen off of his front porch, but he had brought it somewhere else. And there was a great article in Gizmodo here that kind of details uh, some amateur sleuthing being done by folks on the internet who uh, found that this story just didn't quite stack up, that this package was stolen just so many times from this one particular area. And as a result, the creator of the video admitted that uh, two of the five reactions here in the video probably should not have been in the video because they were not actually thieves opening the package. Uh, what happened was is that he offered a friend of a friend uh, compensation if the package was stolen from his front porch, the friend of a friend's porch, uh, and then successfully recovered. So in other words, if the package sat there and didn't get stolen, he wouldn't get paid. Uh, but if it did get stolen and then they could go out and recover the package successfully after it deployed fart and glitter, uh, then he would pay the person for that uh, activity. And you can imagine that if you were that person and package theft doesn't seem to happen all that often in your neighborhood, maybe you would compel some friends to uh, steal the package and get sprayed with glitter and fart for a little bit to get a piece of the action here. And given the popularity of this video, uh, it's probably made him a lot of money. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he offered to pay these these people, but I would imagine it wasn't chump change. He probably offered a good amount of money to uh, have this occur. Maybe he didn't think the person would commit some kind of fraud in order to get this money from him, but nonetheless, it happened. It made its way into the video, and I was watching this thinking, you know, I, I understand this is an entertainment thing. The guy's an engineer. The package is legit. He really put a lot of good work into this thing, but we as creators I think need to hold ourselves to a higher standard than even the regular mainstream media holds itself to. Uh, because independent content creation is constantly under assault uh, from our competitors, namely the mainstream media that we have been slowly replacing uh, over the last three or four years here. There's a lot of revenue now that's not going to TV, that's not going to newspapers and radio and magazines, but is finding its way uh, to the uh, YouTube where we are, uh, but also to other platforms where independent creators are now able to earn a living without having to ask permission of anyone to do what they do. And it's a really exciting time. But I am very concerned that uh, there, of course, is going to be an effort afoot by people who see independent content creation as a threat uh, to make it more difficult for us to earn a living doing this because, again, we are extracting revenue uh, from regular sources of media. And this is an example of the kinds of things that we should not be doing as creators. It just it really kind of stinks that you would go out and pay somebody to try to get a result here. And maybe it was not his intention to uh, pay for these thefts that occurred, but the reality was by not uh, offering compensation unless the package got stolen uh, means that it probably would create a situation where people would be motivated to steal the package uh, in order to get paid here. And again, we just have to do better than this. I think he did the right thing by adjusting the video and by putting this uh, statement up, which does, I think, set the record straight. This is what you should do after the fact when something like this occurs. But 
uh, he really shouldn't have done it in the first place. I think he probably would have had a strong video, even with the first theft, which was legitimate, off his front porch. And I'm sure he probably felt like the video needed more to be, you know, a little bit more entertaining. But this is the result of it. So uh, I just wanted to put this out here because, you know, I don't think the whole thing was a fake. I think it probably was stolen the way he said it was. Uh, but again, you can't start doing this kind of unethical stuff uh, in the chase of views and attention and growth because it really devalues the entire platform, including those of us who are trying to do it the right way. Now, there was one other thing buried in this Gizmodo story about this incident that really intrigued me. Apparently, YouTube allowed him to upload a new version of the video to the same page. So he didn't lose any of his momentum insofar as views and uh, algorithm placement were concerned. They actually allowed a swap out. Uh, Marcus Brownlee discovered Google doing that with one of their own videos a little bit earlier in the week with the Pixel 3 as well. So apparently there is some way to swap out a video on YouTube if you've got something uh, big enough on the platform. But again, this is the kind of stuff that drives me crazy that you've got you know, not necessarily fraud here, but something that wasn't done above board, and there's really no penalty for it for people that are large enough. And uh, meanwhile, folks like you and me who make a mistake in a video and already have a lot of traffic on it have to just get rid of all of it, delete the video, and re-upload again. So I would love to see this feature get uh, brought down to the rest of us masses, because I'm sure many of you would love to be able to replace a video every once in a while after it's gotten some traction. And this story in The Atlantic really got me going, too, because apparently people on Instagram are posting fake sponsored content in the hopes of attracting real sponsors, first of all, but also in the hopes of attracting more followers. Uh, one of the quotes from the article says, it's street cred. The more sponsors you have, the more credibility you have, which really concerns me that this is what Instagram is turning into. Uh, it's already been a place where we've had a lot of things not appropriately disclosed when there were sponsored posts going on. Uh, we had, of course, the infamous Fire Festival where a bunch of uh, celebrities were paid to post things that they didn't disclose properly, and they ended up having a plane load of people or more uh, stuck on a tropical island chained inside an airport uh, because there was no festival when they showed up. Remember that one? I'll put a link to that down below in the video description. So this apparently is what uh, is coming up here on Instagram. And again, this really bothers me because you can't have a legitimate media uh, when people are constantly on the take here and not disclosing things properly. And now it's so bad they're faking being on the take. I just don't get it. Maybe I'm old. I don't know. You tell me down in the comments below, but I don't like the way this stuff is going. I'm not against sponsorships, but at least be upfront with people. And Instagram is a place where I just can't get my head around right now. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments below. All right, I'm going to go yell at some people to get off my porch. But before I do, I want to have a Q&A with you, the viewers. And our first question comes in from Screen Playhouse LLC. Uh, because you'll recall last week or the week before, I was talking about how often my content gets re-uploaded, especially around the holiday season. And one of the things that uh, Screen Playhouse was wondering is why doesn't YouTube just filter this stuff out before it gets uploaded and then give me the opportunity to authorize it or not so we don't have this issue of potential views and affiliate revenue going to people that are representing themselves as me. And unfortunately, it can't work that way. Uh, because of how the DMCA safe harbor here works in the United States. And when they passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act way back in 1996, uh, one of the concerns that uh, the big website providers had at the time was that they could not control the behavior of their users. So for example, if you had a message board and you allowed anyone to post to it, uh, they didn't want to be held responsible if somebody happened to upload copyrighted content to it. Uh, and as a result of that, in the law, it says that so long as you're not controlling what your users post, you have a safe harbor. So for an example of a safe harbor, let's play out this scenario. Uh, let's say I have a message board and one of you decides to upload some Nintendo game ROMs to my message board. Uh, and Nintendo comes across and sees these ROMs on my message board. Uh, you are the one responsible for that, not me, because I did not post what you posted. I have a safe harbor uh, because I did not control that portion of my website that you're uploading to. Now, Nintendo can go to me and say, hey, that user put some copyrighted material up on the site. You need to take it down. That, hence, is the DMCA takedown notice. 
I have to act on that because if I don't, I am now liable as well. Once I'm notified of infringing content, it is my responsibility as a platform, even a tiny one, to take that stuff down. Now, if I was uh, approving every post before it went up and I approved a post with ROMs in it, I would be held liable for it because I am considered now the publisher who's reviewed something before it got uploaded. It's a very small distinction to some degree, but a distinction nonetheless. And if YouTube uh, put such a thing in place, uh, that function of evaluating content first before allowing it to be published would make YouTube liable for copyrighted content that appears on their platform. Now, YouTube, of course, has been sued in the past because a lot of these rights holders have accused them of not doing enough to help identify the content that's been uploaded. That's why they invented Content ID, for example, which I know a lot of you have struggled with over the years. Uh, but there's been some uh, real tests of this law, uh, one about a year ago in the Ninth Circuit Court, and I can't find any uh, resolution to this. I don't know if it's gone to the Supreme Court and rejected, but it looks like uh, at the moment at any rate, even sites that have moderators might be liable for content that was posted. Uh, there's a trial that you can see here on the link on screen. Apparently a court of appeals determined that even moderator approved content, even if they don't work necessarily for the platform directly and are just volunteering, like a volunteer on Reddit, for example, uh, might, hold, might actually hold the whole platform liable for content that's posted because it is a pre-approval in some cases. Uh, so this might have some impact out there. Again, this was a year ago. I haven't heard much more on this trial, but it's definitely uh, something to take a look at. Now, what YouTube is doing for creators of a certain size is now giving you the ability to see when people re-upload your content. They're kind of opening up uh, what was limited to just a very small number of creators through Content ID in a more broad fashion. I believe right now this is limited to creators with 100,000 subscribers or more, uh, but what it's going to do is probably make use of the technology behind Content ID. It'll look at when your content was uploaded and then see if this matched content appeared after the time that you uploaded it, and they give now creators of a certain size the ability to more efficiently locate that content and file a takedown claim on it. Uh, they also give you the ability to reach out to the creator who took your content and maybe have a dialogue with them if you want to do something like that. So we're starting to see more happen here, but the reason why uh, they can't pre-screen this stuff and why I have to go and issue so many takedowns is that YouTube would lose their safe harbor if they uh, did that for uh, this platform. So it has to be users can upload first and then it gets taken down later. And the identification, of course, is the challenge when you've got billions of videos uh, sitting up on that platform. But nonetheless, that was what the law prescribes here. And in my Plex video with the title service, we talked a little bit about lossless audio and why it's better than the compressed audio that we often get from our favorite streaming services. And some folks say, well, I can't hear the difference. I think it's a waste to have these huge files or spend as much as titles asking for their lossless service. I will agree with you on the cost of the title lossless service. I do wish it costs less than 20 bucks a month. Uh, but there is some real value for people that have nice speakers to have really high quality audio to listen to it on. And that was one of the things that uh, Trelexin brings up in this post. His, his post is actually longer than this. So you may want to check it out uh, on that video page. And what people don't realize is that even though we're in the 21st century and everything is so modern and awesome and available to us at the push of a button, uh, the reality is music sounded better out of CDs that came out 20 something years ago, 30 years ago now, than what we're getting from most of these major streaming services, including Apple and uh, Spotify and others, because they are compressing the music in a way where you're losing some of the audio information. Uh, in the car, it's fine perhaps, depending on what your audio system is, but a lot of people are not getting the best quality uh, out of these speakers they're buying because they are using something like a streaming service or purchasing compressed audio and not getting the original. So what I've been doing, and I did a video on this a few weeks ago, uh, is going back through my old CD collection, which has been sitting dormant upstairs for a long time, and re-ripping all of the CDs to FLAC so that I have a lossless source on my Plex server. Uh, and then if I'm going out or something and want just a smaller amount of storage on my phone, I'll have Plex compress it down to MP3 in a more manageable so file size for uh, going out on the road in my car where perhaps the audio doesn't make as much of a difference. But I think he's right about that. If you are into music, you probably owe it to yourself to get the best possible quality. Uh, you can now buy lossless audio directly. There's a number of services selling that 
Uh, and of course, Tidal has their uh, lossless uh, streaming service that you can make use of now as well. And I think what happened with all these lossy audio formats is that when things rolled out and you could actually legitimately buy a track online and listen to it, uh, we had just enough bandwidth and just enough storage to make this a viable thing for people. It sounded good enough for most consumers to the point where they didn't hear all that much of a difference between uh, what an MP3 sounded like versus the CDs. And I remember uh, the first time I acquired a, an MP3 file, I believe it was like 96 or 97, I was blown away that a file that small could sound that good because up until that time, my friends and I had been messing around with ripping CDs onto our hard drive, but we were left with essentially a couple hundred megabytes of uh, music tracks that didn't make it convenient for uh, having all of your music in one location stored digitally. You just didn't have the hard drive space to accommodate uh, more than a CD or two. And all of a sudden you could put a bunch of tracks on a zip disk, for example, and later burn a lot more to uh, something like a CD-R for getting more and more music in one location as opposed to having to continually swap out disks and whatnot. That was a big convenience item uh, and something that I think made a big difference, especially when we didn't have the bandwidth or the storage. Now we do, so that's why I am going back through and uh, getting everything ripped to that hard drive. And I got a related question the other day from Dave for Schmups about how long did it take to download a game from a BBS back in the day? Uh, he's 41, but he never got on one when he was younger. And it used to take a really long time, depending on what kind of modem you had. And then if your sister picked up the phone, for example, uh, it would blow up your session and you'd have to start all over again. Uh, so a lot of times this would cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Uh, the money portion would be if you were on a service like Genie or uh, CompuServe that would charge by the hour. Uh, or in my case, I would dial into free BBS systems, but they were outside my local calling area. So I had a you know, dial a long distance call, which was not cheap back then either. So my parents were often not happy with me, but they were happy I wasn't getting into trouble. So maybe that was the benefit there. Uh, so let me give you an example of how long it did take to download a game. We'll take a look at Doom, which is celebrating, I believe it's 25th anniversary this month. It came out in December of 1993. And I think this was probably one of the last big games that got its start on the uh, BBS infrastructure that was out there at the time. Now this was two megabytes in size, uh, which I think was the largest shareware game that I had ever seen come across a BBS at that point. Uh, the games were getting bigger and bigger, but not this big. And this was like the hottest game that was out there and it was better than anything you could buy at the store. And that was what was so cool about Doom was that it was being distributed in, in a way that most games now are distributed in. But back then it was a big deal to be able to download this and uh, get it going immediately. Uh, so on my 14.4 modem, which was a luxury item back in the day, it took 19 minutes and 25 seconds thereabouts to uh, download a full complete package of the Doom Shareware Edition. Now, a lot of people back at that point were still on their 2400 baud modem, uh, and that was going to take an hour and 56 minutes, basically two hours. Now, when we say 14.4K, that is 14.4K bits per second, not megabits, 14.4 bits per second. Uh, so today with my 300 megabit per second downstream Comcast connection, that two megabyte file comes in almost instantaneously. Uh, here it took about 20 minutes and again, almost two hours on uh, another device. Now I had one of these luxury items. This was my 14.4 modem from probably 1992 or so. I got it for half price because I ran a bulletin board system. And what Practical Peripherals, the manufacturer of this modem did, was that they offered it at half price to BBS system operators. And you had to, in exchange, uh, advertise that you were using this modem uh, on your bulletin board system when people first logged in. So the welcome message would say, powered by a Practical Peripherals whatever. Uh, and that was the trade-off there. But I was more than happy to uh, mow lawns for the summer to be able to buy this $250 modem to get up and running with it. And uh, that was quite a thing for me to be able to download those games a lot quicker. Uh, and it was something that wasn't all that cheap though for everybody else who didn't have a BBS. Now this is taken from the December edition of the PC Magazine uh, back in uh, 1993. So this is really the, the modem you'd be able to buy at the time that uh, Doom was first made available. So the 14.4 modems uh, dropped in price significantly at, by this point. In fact, you could get a really high quality US Robotics internal Sportster modem uh, for $185. That was a pretty good price back then. 
Uh, that is about 300 bucks and change in uh, 2018 here. So you can see really how expensive this stuff was to get a you know, modem that could download that quickly. So a lot of people, again, were still on that older one. And uh, again, it was very prone to interruption. So if somebody picked up the phone or something happened to the connection, uh, the worst one was when it, you forgot to disable the uh, call waiting feature where you get that beep so that you would know somebody was calling in. Uh, you want to disable that, otherwise you get knocked off your session as well. So it was not a fun time to download big files back then. And that's why things like PC Gamer here became really popular. Uh, this was the first edition of the PC Gamer CD that they would bundle with their magazine. Uh, and this was great because you could get all of these huge demos. Now, remember, we went from uh, 1993 with the two megabyte Doom game to having, I think, uh, several hundred megabyte or maybe a hundred and something megabyte demo for Wing Commander 3 coming out not all that much later. So uh, these CDs kind of became the conduit for me uh, because it was just impossible to download uh, some of this stuff over a, an internet connection. Even when the 28.8 and the 56K modems came out, these CDs made a big difference. What's cool is if you go to that link that you see on screen, uh, you can go and download disk images of these old CDs from archive.org. So if you wanted to see what it was like to be a gamer back in the early 90s, uh, these are really good little time capsules that you can basically just download and, and run and get a real feel for uh, what it was like to, I think at this point, game on DOS, because this was before Windows 95 came out. So you could probably load this up in DOSBox and get a really cool experience from the uh, past. Maybe we'll do that one day on a live stream. That might be kind of fun to do. And speaking of downloading games, if you got some time as you're enjoying the holidays to play with your new Nintendo Switch, there is a great selection of eShop games detailed on the Beat 'em Ups channel. Uh, Wood here has done a number of these videos now where he does 10 eShop games each. So you're bound to find a few things that uh, you like. And what I love about his channel is that uh, he, first of all, loves the Nintendo Switch. He finds a lot of these little hidden gem eShop games that you probably would have never heard of before. And he's got a very diverse taste in games, so he's looking at things from a very broad perspective, and he's undoubtedly going to find something that you like. In fact, I've bought a lot of games based on his recommendations, and he actually buys a lot of the games that he plays, too. So definitely check it out. Uh, he's got a great selection of stuff there. He just posted a new one the other day with a game called Everspace that I'm eager to check out on my Switch. Uh, so if you are having a hard time finding some of those eShop gems, uh, definitely check out Wood's channel. So this week, we've got at least two videos planned, plus the one you're watching now. Uh, we have the review of the Y7000P gaming laptop from Lenovo ready to go. So that one will be up a little later in the week. Uh, but before that, we're going to do an unboxing of this Macintosh Plus that I acquired recently. Uh, and it actually went sort of okay, but we did have a little snafu midway through that uh, kind of pivoted the video to uh, Macintosh emulation. So it's kind of a twofer there. Uh, we didn't have any smoke like we had out of the Apple 2GS a few years ago, but it did uh, not get through the whole video again. So I've got to bring in somebody here to help me fix all this stuff that's now accumulating. But I uh, did find this uh, Mac Plus pretty much in the box with all of its stuff. It wasn't new in the box, but it had a complete set of everything. So it might be fun to watch me unbox that and get it booted up. And I have this little floppy drive emulator thing that's kind of fun in there too. So check it out. It should be up in the next day or two. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can make a one-time contribution uh, via my donor box page. We also still take Patreon as well. And we still have our ongoing relationship with Plex. So if you sign up for a Plex account, no credit card required, we'll get a small commission for that. And if you haven't gotten a gift for the special people in your life, you still have time to get a Plex Pass gift uh, that you can get on the link here on screen uh, to gift that Plex Pass subscription to somebody in your life. So don't hesitate, get it done and be a hero at the holidays there. Uh, we also have a number of other channels that I do, including my extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We have the podcast channel, which is audio versions of this show. We have the snippets channel that has portions of this show in more search-friendly uh, formats there. And we have my live streams where I archive all of the previous live streams that I have done. And my most recent live stream was a few weeks ago where I got in a, a Sega Tower of Power, a Sega Genesis, a Sega CD, and a 32X. And I had bought this package just to get the Sega CD for when the new analog console 
uh, comes out later in the spring because it will work with that Sega CD. Uh, but we did get it up and running and tested, and it turns out the 32X I was not intending to get actually works better than the one I had. So that was kind of a fun one. I might actually push that one out to subscribers this week if I fall short on that third video. Now, if you want to get notified anytime we do something here on the channel, click on the bell so you can get a notification whenever something happens here. We also have my email list, which is very infrequent. It's at lon.tv slash email, so you can get email notifications from time to time. Uh, we still have the Facebook page where I upload videos as well. I put a lot of the extras channel stuff up there along with videos from this channel a few days after they are on YouTube. And then we have the Facebook group, which is almost to 600, uh, which is awesome. So you can join up there and have a conversation with me and other viewers. I pop in there quite a bit. And then we have the store at lon.tv slash store where I sell the used items that I reviewed here on the channel. And if you want to get a notification when I update the store, you can sign up for my store alert at lon.tv slash store alert. Right now we are out of stock of everything, uh, but I do have a pile of stuff back there that I do need to get to. So we will have more stuff going up soon. If you sign up for that email list, you'll get a notification as soon as that stuff makes it up onto the store. And I appreciate everybody helping me out by getting rid of all the stuff that needs to go. Uh, so I greatly appreciate that. My wife thanks you as well. So that is going to do it for this last wrap up of 2018. It has been a very fast year and a very enjoyable year. I want to thank all of you for your support, no matter how you send that support, uh, especially those of you who watch all the time. Really, watching is the most important thing here to keep those watch time hours going. And it's just been a fabulous second year in business here as a full time person. I want to thank you all. Uh, for everything to help make uh, this dream of running my own little media company a reality. I got a lot of fun stuff planned for the coming year, I'm hoping to try to find some ways to grow out this business model a bit. So we'll be talking about that as things move along here. I wish you a very Merry Christmas if you're celebrating and a very happy holiday season and a very safe and happy new year as well. And here's to 2019. Let's keep going. We'll talk to you all soon uh, once we get through the end of 2018. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.